Thank everyone for the music. We appreciate it. And uh, always blessed every morning and every evening that we come, don't we, with some just wonderful music. So we appreciate it very much. Well, if you brought your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, and we'll be looking at this evening verses 45 through 56. So we'll pick up where we left off last week. Mark, again, 6, 45 through the end of the chapter there. And the title of the message is in the bulletin as well is Take Courage, It Is I. When we come to faith in Jesus, we are never promised a life of perfect ease. We will still encounter, having come to faith in Jesus, obstacles, dif difficult situations. But the Bible does teach us that he is always close, always has his eye on us, and he always cares for us. This evening we're going to be provided with a reminder of these truths in a passage that we've probably all at least heard or are familiar with when Jesus walks on creation. He's going to walk on the sea there in Galilee. And he's going to remind us of these truths again, that he's always close. He always has his eye on us. He always cares for us, even when we might not think he does. And so hopefully tonight you will do what he says there, the exhortation to take courage because of who Christ is. And that's what we're going to look at this evening. If you'd like to take notes... We'll pick up and we're going to look at verses 45 through 46, time alone in prayer. And then the main portion of the passage that we look at this evening is take courage it is I, verses 47 through 52. And you'll notice also too when we go through there's more than one miracle that happens. It's not just the walking on the sea, so more on that later. And then finally we'll end on a positive note. How many of you would like to end on a positive note tonight? Well, thankfully, that's where it ends. It ends on a positive note with a summary of what Jesus is doing in a particular location once they overcome the storm through Christ. So let's pick up and let's just read the entirety, verses 45 through 56, <clears throat> excuse me, of Mark chapter 6. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Seeing them straining at, their, at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gesariot and moored to the shore. When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran that whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets those who were sick to the place where they heard he was. Wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many touched it, were being cured. Now, as we pick up again in the end here of chapter 6, we're getting closer to the time where the gospel changes, and there makes a change in the narrative and the story, but we're still in the section where the servant is ministering in Galilee, and when you get to, again, if you remember, Mark 8.26 and 8.27, what you're going to have is a change. Jesus is going to say, in effect, I don't care what anyone else says, I want to know who you think I am, Peter. Peter makes that great, astonishing confession, and then from then forward, he makes his journey to Jerusalem. But we're not quite there yet. Uh, we're still in that section where he's ministering in Galilee. 
Now in chapter 6, we come to the ending of it, and if you don't remember, essentially what happens in brevity is Jesus returns to Nazareth, he's rejected, he gives instructions to the twelve to go out, but he tells them, don't take anything with you. You have to learn to trust that I'm going to provide and that my provision is sufficient for your need. But he also teaches them to deal with rejection because it isn't as though they're going to go and everybody's going to receive the message openly or in a positive manner. And what he does is eventually gives an example of what I call the cost of discipleship. It's costly to follow Jesus sometimes. All the time, no, but sometimes it is. And he gives an example of John the Baptist. After giving the example of John the Baptist, the disciples come back and they're tired. They've been serving the Lord Jesus. And, of course, he tells them they need to go away and they spend some time resting. But the resting doesn't last very long because Jesus is compassionate, sympathetic, and he sees the people without a shepherd. What are they likened to? I use it the example of today. It's like most people today that you walk out into this lost world and the people in darkness. Why? Because they don't have Christ. To not have Christ is not to have a shepherd. It's to be lost. It's to be in utter darkness. But the Lord, of course, in His compassion, He provides for them the 5,000 plus. You remember? The little bit of fish and the biscuit, and it was enough for Him to do what? multiplication beyond anything we can imagine. And they needed to trust Him. He had provided for them before He would then, and to make and drive the point home, how many baskets were there? Twelve left over, one for each of the disciples. And, of course, that is the end of the story there. Now, as we pick up here and we see that from last week, immediately after feeding the 5,000 Jesus is going to instruct the disciples to get in the boat and to go to the other side of Bethsaida there at the Sea of Galilee. Now, one of the interesting things is, of course, we don't have this in Mark's account, but some people might be thinking to yourself, why the urgency? Why does he need to hurry up and leave? I mean, he could just stay there, right? I mean, he could have just stayed there. But there's a particular reason why there is this urgency to hurry up and leave. And I want you to turn with me to John chapter 6. This is right after the feeding of the 5,000. And in John chapter 6, you actually are given the answer to the reason why there is such an urgency for them to leave. It's in John chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. And again, each of the Gospels are picturing Jesus and portraying Him in a certain way. In John here, of course, in verses 14 through 15, what do we have? Well, we have the feeding of the 5,000 where we left off. There's one basket for each of the 12 disciples. But let's just read because it tells you in verse 14 and 15. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, this is the miracle of of the feeding there, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Notice verse 15, though. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and to force him to be made into a king, he withdrew. That's the answer. Jesus was being, of course, being knowing that they were going to force him to be king. Is Jesus the king of the Jews? Yes. Then, no. In other words, that wasn't the right time. Jesus still needed to go to the cross. He still needed to fulfill what he had been called to do, which is to go to be crucified for the sins of the world. So Jesus king, yes, then no. And that's really important. And you can go back and you can see that there was a time and there is a time for Jesus to become king. That wasn't the right time. Jesus actually has been tempted with that already by Lucifer himself. In Matthew 4, 8 through 10, he says you can avoid the cross and can avoid all of what is before you if you will do what? Bow down and I'll give you the kingdoms right now. Why would Satan do that? Because he knows that God's Son is the inheritor of the kingdoms of this world and that He will reign on them. So again, you have to understand, Jesus, is He king? Yes. Will He be king? Yes. Then no. 
It wasn't God's time. God has a particular time in which Jesus will come and to be king. And the Lord's perfect timing needs to be sought and everything, doesn't it? So often we rush ahead. Hurry up, make him king. And Jesus flees from it. Why? Because it's not the right time. God has a particular time for things. And you and I need to know that God has a perfect time for everything. And the perfect time was not then. And so there is this urgency for Jesus to leave Now, if we go back into Mark, and I just want you to see that, because Mark says that they immediately flee and leave, and you're thinking, why? Well, because he knows that that isn't the time for him to be, if you will, forced into kingship. Later, yes, he'll be king, but then, no. So he instructs the disciples back in Mark chapter 6. He instructs the disciples to go to the other side of Bethsaida. Now, later... I'll explain to you this, and we'll get a grasp of where they are and different things in terms of the miracle. But I want us to pay attention to something, and it says, After he bid them farewell, so the twelve get into the boat, and they are proceeding to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, leaving the area near Bethsaida. Jesus went off to pray. Isn't that amazing? The Lord Jesus went off. He knew he needed time of prayer. And this wasn't the first or the last time that he would go and be alone with the Lord in prayer. I thought of Mark 1.35. He went off and had a night of prayer. The night before he chose the twelve in Luke 6.12, what did he do? He spent a night in prayer. What does he do in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prays. What does he do when he, of course, in John 17, what does he do? He prays. Jesus shows the pattern that you and I are to follow, which is we can never be too busy to stop and pray. I mean, Jesus was really busy. This was a very active time in ministry. And Jesus stopped what he was doing to go and to spend time alone with the Father. Don't you and I think we need to do that sometimes? If the Lord Jesus stopped sometimes and went alone and had time of prayer. Don't we need to do the same? I mentioned to you last week that he told the disciples to go away and rest. Why is that? I think it's very apropos for today because we live in a society that is what? Eight days a week, 25 hours a day, go, 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 go. And that's the determining factor of whether or not we are successful. And that's contrary to what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that man at best could go six days and then he collapses if he tries seven days too long. Man is not made for that. God has not made our bodies that way. And it's okay sometimes to rest. It's okay to go away and sometimes have time alone with the Lord. And if someone's sitting there thinking, yeah, but that's not the way the culture is, we shouldn't be concerned with what the culture says, but what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that we are not fit to go, 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 go all the time. We need to have that time alone in the Lord. So if you text me sometime and I don't answer you right away, that's probably why. Or I'm making coffee. But either way, one of the two is probably true. Or both at the same time. We'll see. But anyway... I just want you to see that. But let's move forward now and let's go into the miracles, plural, that we see in verses 47 through 52. Now this one has always been interesting. It's one of those ones we're so familiar with it that we probably just overlook it. I think sometimes familiarity breeds contempt. And what I mean by that is, oh, we've heard this a million times. There's nothing I could ever learn that's new. Don't be so sure. I actually think those ones are some of the ones we typically miss because we think we know. But this one has always been an intriguing one to me. But in verses 47 through 52, so Mark continues, and after Jesus has sent them away, he's going to find them in a very distressing situation, but everything is under control. From the Lord's standpoint, from the disciples' standpoint, the whole world is falling apart. Now, let's look and see here in verses 47 through 52, when it was evening. So there is a sequence to it. I think John probably describes the sequence perhaps a little bit more in terms of time. But in any case, we'll see this. But you'll notice in verse 47, when it was evening, we find the boat somewhere in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Where is Jesus? It's emphasizing in the Gospels that he is away from them and he is alone. In other words, the disciples are by themselves out in the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is not present. 
Okay? And that's the key takeaway at the first part of this. So when would evening be? Well, we don't know exactly because if you were to say, well, church starts in the evening, that's not really very helpful, is it? Because that's sort of a broad period of time. But let's just for argument's sake use the Jewish reckoning of time. So somewhere around 6 p.m., give or take. So at 6 p.m., they are aware. Well, it says in the middle of the sea and Jesus was not there with them. Now, curiously enough, how far out do they get? Well, in John 6:19, it tells them by tells us by stadia how long that is. That's the measuring period of time. They get about three or four miles out. If you are confused in a minute, I'll show you about how far they get, and it's not very far. The Sea of Galilee is much further than that. They get about three or four miles out, and when does Jesus come? Well, notice what happens in verse 48. Jesus saw them, and they were straining in their, with their oars. Was Jesus aware of their predicament? Yes. He is describing them in Greek as basically taking and digging their oars in, and they're getting nowhere. They are rowing and rowing and rowing, and they get nowhere. They are just in perpetual state of rowing. They're straining their oars here. It gives this idea of that. But you'll notice at about the fourth watch, then Jesus came. This is the beauty of it. So if you go with six in the evening, and you know that they go about, we'll say, three to four miles, depending on where it is, and we'll see in a map here in a second, a picture. Jesus comes to the fourth watch, and you're thinking, oh, well, they're probably out there about an hour. No. Actually, it could be anywhere from 8, 9, 10, 11 hours they were out there rowing and rowing and rowing, and they get nowhere. How do we know that? Because the fourth watch began at 3 a.m. So just go with the ease of math. Somewhere around 6 in the evening, they find themselves in the middle of the Sea of Galilee getting nowhere, and there is this massive storm that comes, and Jesus sees them. And how long does he come? He takes some time, doesn't he, from our standpoint? He doesn't come right away. He doesn't come at earliest until 3 a.m. I want you to picture yourself out there in the Sea of Galilee and these waves in the seas are raging. The fishermen who by trade should be schooled in this are terrified of what's happening and they row from 6 p.m. to let's say 3 in the morning. You're thinking you're in distress. Now you begin to see what is going on here. Now, where about would they be? Well, we don't know exactly. But we do know where Bethsaida is, and there is the entrance point by the Jordan River. And I put a little red arrow there, so if you're facing it, it would be to your right. The left arrow is roughly about where they're headed, and that's just approximate. The, air, the star there is roughly, and again, obviously I can't do that exactly, it's about where they are and about where they've been for hours and hours and hours and hours. So what is the setting? Jesus is praying. Everything is under control. The disciples are rowing, and they're getting nowhere. And they probably are thinking to themselves, Jesus has left us out here on the Sea of Galilee to die, right? I'm sure none of you would have thought that. Now, he's forgot we are out here. He's been gone too long, and he's forgot. I love this uh, particular quote by uh, David Jeremiah. He says, The Lord sometimes waits until his followers have exhausted all their resources before he steps in. Why? Because the Lord can be trusted no matter how impossible a situation is. Why? He's watching He knows what's going on. He hasn't left them. He hasn't abandoned them there. What he wants to teach the disciples is a lesson on this, which is they can trust him because of who he is. They could trust him in the past. They could trust him in the present. And they could trust him in the future. But Jesus sometimes has to take us to the brink of chaos because you know why? We're hard-headed, aren't we? We are. Sometimes we sit there and we think to ourselves, the Lord has taught me this in the past, He's told me this before, and I get amnesia, and I forget. 
And Jesus wants to drive home the point to these disciples that they can trust him, no matter how impossible the situation is. And let me ask you this. In the book of Acts, do they just have a peachy, easy road? No, that's an impossible set of chapter after chapter after chapter. But every single time the Lord carries them through, doesn't he? And of course, we know that is true for you and I. He is never away. I want to draw your attention one last time to that. Notice verse 48. He saw them there. He saw them. He wasn't too far away, even though they may have thought that he was far off. The Lord was there. And what does Jesus do? Well, he waits. And he waits an hour after hour after hour. And then Jesus comes at the third, uh, 3 a.m., perhaps somewhere around the fourth watch. But I want to ask you this question. Why should they trust him? I mean, if he's just a man who is a really good teacher, why would they trust him? So there's another side of this as well. Now, uh, you'll notice here... At the end of verse 48, some pe- people sometimes get a little confused that he intended to pass them by. Now, this is not him wanting to say, well, look at those guys out there. Good luck. Good luck, let me tell you. Ask me, tell me how it turns out type thing. I want you to turn in Exodus 33, and you'll be able to put these pieces together as soon as I read the first verse. Because he's not intending to leave them out there. He's been watching them the whole time. And nothing's going to happen to them. They think it. But nothing's going to happen to them. But if you get to Exodus 33 and verse 18... I have it up there for you through verse 22. We won't read all of it because honestly, as soon as I start reading it, you'll probably recognize it. Let's just read it. Exodus 33, beginning in verse 18. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. Now, how is God going to reveal his glory? Verse 19, and he said, I myself will make all my goodness, notice, pass before you. And will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. You can read the rest of it. It's mentioned again in verse 22. What? I'll let my glory pass by you. That's what Jesus intended to do, was to send them out there on the Sea of Galilee, thinking that he had forgotten them after all of these hours, And then Jesus was going to pass by, display his glory. Now go back to verse 49 in Mark 6. But, notice, but, what happened? They saw him walking on the sea, thought he was a ghost, and screamed. Ah, who in the world is this? You see what is happening here? Jesus sends them off. He's got his eye on them the whole time. They don't know it. He's praying. The situation is under control. He intended to wait until they were out there so they could see his magisterial glory walking on the creation. And what happens? They freak out. And they should have had that fear replaced by his presence there. Because he's shown them for over six chapters that his presence was enough, that if he was there, they had everything under control. But one of the interesting aspects of this as well is actually found in the book of Job. Because I want to ask you a question. Does anyone have the ability to walk on creation? Meaning when I say that, the sea. One person alone and his name is Yahweh. Look in Job with me. And there's other places, but this one's a little bit different, uh, just to give you a little bit of a different glance on this. And there's other places in the Psalms. But you have to remember, God's Word tells us what God is able to do, and Jesus is doing it. And so, alas, what's the conclusion? It's the Son of God. So there's many pieces at work here, but what we're getting here is a glimpse of not only the timing of the miracle, which is miraculous, but again, Job's just a little bit of a different uh, take on it. But Job 9, 8, who alone stretches out the heavens and who tramples down on the waves of the sea? 
That in Hebrew means who treads on the sea. And of course it's rhetorical, it's only God. Only God has the ability to walk on the sea. Now look at the other one in Job I have up there. Job 38 verse 16. Now when you get to Job 38, God, after having all of these people, yap, 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 until the end of chapter 37, the talking is over and God speaks. And he ends everyone else's speaking. I don't know if you know that about the book of Job. The first two chapters describe the situation. And then Job's friends talk and talk and talk until the end of 37. Because, of course, they know everything that's going on. And then God steps in and says, you have no idea at all. But in this dialogue in Job 38, verse 16, notice this is God here in this sort of rebuke says... In Job 38, verse 16, Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked on the recesses of the deep? And of course, this is a rebuke because he's been saying, Were you there when I created everything? Do you know how everything was formed? Because I was the only one there. And here he's saying, I'm the only one who walks on the creation. Now I want you to stop and think for yourself again. Put two and two together. If Jesus is doing what only God can do, and Jesus' purpose was to come to reveal God to us, who is Jesus? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, God manifest in the flesh. Look here, friends. Jesus is no prophet alone. He's no teacher alone. He's no kumbaya friend. He is God in the flesh, almighty. And he is treading all over what only God can do. Beloved, if he came in this sanctuary right now, you would be down flat on your face. We would be not doing fist bumps before him, would we? Blaspheming him. We would be in respect and awe of him. But back here in our passage in Mark, we get to see what his intent was. His intent was to reveal the glory that he was displaying to show His glory as He passed by them. They're terrified and they're afraid. And Jesus' compassion breaks forth, doesn't it? Does He rebuke them? No, He's pretty gracious, isn't He? Time and time again, He tells the disciples these things. They can't quite seem to get them. And what is Jesus' response? Instead, He says, take courage, it's I. And that's all you need to know. I am here And everything is under total, complete control. The problem that they had is something else we'll look at. But you say, what's the second miracle? We often think it's only one, which is him treading on creation. Look at verse 51. Jesus got in the boat and the waves just kept going in the wind, right? No. Creation ceases at his presence and his awe and majesty. Isn't that amazing? Jesus not only walked and displayed His magisterial glory before them, He gets into the boat and everything just stops immediately. Can God bring everything into creation just by speaking it? Yes. Can He make everything stop in an instant? Yes, just like that. It doesn't seem too far-fetched that in six days He could bring forth absolutely everything. And here he is doing all of this, and then you have the rebuke at the end. Notice verse 52. For they had not gained any insight into the incident of the loaves. Remember? They did not remember. They had not learned the previous lesson. But you'll notice at the end of verse 52. Their heart was hardened. They were closed, and they had a dull mind. They could not fully understand. Now, obviously, on the one hand, we need to be gracious with them. I'm usually sort of both with the disciples. I think sometimes we're a little too hard on them because we have over 2,000 years of revelation. But the point is here, clearly, they should have at least known that Jesus had not left them out in the ocean. He had not left them out in the sea, that he was there and they could trust him. But, of course, they still had yet to learn that valuable lesson. What Jesus was teaching them, that he would be with them no matter what they faced. And they needed to know that because, beloved, he wasn't going to be there with them in his presence always. They needed to learn to trust him. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but troubles come along. The Lord seems far away, doesn't he? 
You're out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, proverbially speaking, and you feel like he's off on the edge somewhere praying alone, and he's forgotten you all the while he's ever present, isn't he? No storm is either too powerful or can separate us from Christ Jesus. That's what Paul teaches, doesn't he? For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing, that's a lot, isn't it? That's pretty much all, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in all of creation can ever separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. There is nothing in your life that can ever be so far wretched that it could separate us from that. What a great comfort that is, isn't it? All the while he was there, wasn't he? And all the while he is there with us. We aren't out in the Sea of Galilee alone. But we're going to end on a positive note, not on the rebuke of the disciples' hard-headedness. And hopefully none of us are hard-headed or dull in mind and thinking. Hopefully God doesn't have to keep teaching us lessons, does he? (laughs) He does me sometimes. But let's read 53 through 56 just real quickly since I've read it and it's been a bit. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gesaria and moored to the shore. They got exactly where he told them they were going to go. Jesus says, you're going to the other side. You're going to arrive there no matter what comes in that way. And what happens? They arrive there. Let's pick up and read just in case we forgot. When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran about that whole country and began to carry here and there all on their pallets who were sick to the place where he had heard they had heard excuse me he was wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside they were laying the sick in the marketplaces imploring him that he might just touch the they might just touch the fringe of his cloak and as many touched it were being cured so what do we see here it ends on a positive note here notice this probably covers a series of what we would call days or weeks luke would call this a summary statement he's generalizing he's saying this is what happened when they landed and what happened when they landed well they landed in gasariat where is that well somewhere around there and uh, that's what the disciples have posted on their facebook account So I feel like it's probably pretty accurate. Another beautiful picture, huh? Imagine Jesus going around there over a period of days a week. And what do you find out about him? His great compassion. And that's what the summary is showing. Simple faith produced healing. And Jesus didn't kick any of them away. No criteria, no parameters. Christ was compassionate to all if they just came and touched him. You'll notice it talks about the fringe of his cloak. You wonder if that tale, that story of the woman who came and just desired to just touch the edge of that cloak, what is it showing? It shows that Jesus responds to simple faith. The Lord is compassionate and he honors faith no matter how simple it is. Isn't that wonderful? He honors our simple faith that we have. So when we come to faith in Jesus, we are never promised a life of perfect ease. If you've never heard that before, I'm sorry to break the bubble to you tonight. But what I can tell you is that what we are promised, that he will be with us and see us through all those situations. He is there. He is ever present. And he will see us through whatever predicament that he has us in. And we'll end with this, and I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed. I like the way Warren Wearsby puts it. He says, when the hour seems darkest, he will come to us and we will reach the shore. Amen? Amen. Our Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for the opportunity to worship, not just this morning in the Sunday school hour and in the morning service, but Lord, we also thank you for the time to come back this evening. Father, I know sometimes you have to teach us lesson after lesson because in a sense like the disciples, sometimes we can be dull of mind or need reminders or whatever the case may be. But Father, I pray that you remind us tonight that, Lord, first we need to spend time alone with you no matter how busy we get. But Lord, in the end, we need to take courage because Christ is the great I am. 
We can trust him. We know he is there. He may not seem like it, Lord. Sometimes we may feel like you aren't there, but Lord, you are. And we can trust in you. We can trust in your majesty and into your glory. And that there's nothing in all of creation that can separate us from you. Yes, it may feel like it, but that is certainly not the case. And Lord, as we saw at the end, Lord, no matter how dark the hour is, you are there. You will come to us. And Lord, we know we will reach our end. Lord, you are faithful, and we believe and trust in you and your word. Father, as we go out into this lost world this week, I pray that, Lord, you would give us the ability, the boldness, but also the clarity to deliver the good news of Jesus Christ to someone that we may encounter. Lord, this world is dark, and it will remain dark in people's lives until they come to the light of the world, which is Jesus Christ. And we are the only ones with that message. If you put someone before our past this week, may we articulate it clearly and leave the rest to you. Lord, I pray for each person here that you watch over them and protect them this week. Return us again next week. In Christ's name, amen.